Well, hi, everybody. How are we all doing today? Great. Good. My name is Miles Plant, and I am the music director of The Wizard of Oz. And this is the lovely and incredible Caitlin Delsick, who is our resident choreographer for the season. And what we wanted to do for our Off the Clock is invite you all to hear about Caitlin's process and how we collaborate um, here at Clock. And I encourage you, if you at any time have a question, please raise your hand and we will answer whatever pops into your head. Yeah. So, Caitlin, how did you get your start? How did you find dance? How did I find dance? I definitely, my mom put me in dance class when I was two, and I sort of just fell in love with it, and just kept asking me to go back and to go back, so she enrolled me in more and more classes, and I was singing at my dance studio, just in the hallway, just singing for fun, and the acting teacher overheard me and was like, who is this child? And my mom was like, oh no, what has she done? <laughs> and, and he was like, she should really like do musicals. Has she ever been into that? And my mom was said, well, no, but okay. So I went and I auditioned at our local like regional theater, Lyric Theater of Oklahoma. They were doing Annie that year. And I was cast as the understudy of Mo for Molly, which is the youngest orphan. And it just so happened that during our invited dress rehearsal, much like we do here, um, but invited dress rehearsal at this theater is when all the critics come and it's like, it's a fairly packed house, so it's really a soft opening. The Molly got sick and I had to go on. And this was the first musical I had ever done and I got thrown on stage. And I don't know if you all know who Beth Level is, but she was the drowsy chaperone and the drowsy chaperone on Broadway. She was lead in prom. She, I mean, she just has this amazing Broadway career. She was playing Miss Hannigan. So my first scene partner on stage was Beth Level, and it was the most insane experience. I just sort of was bitten by the bug ever since then, and I went on to do a couple Broadway shows as a kid. Um, my mom and I moved up to New York, and um, I did a couple shows then and decided I wanted to have a normal life as, as high school. So I went back to Oklahoma with my parents and finished out high school, went to college at Penn State for musical theater, moved to the city and started, you know, just doing random gigs here and there. Um, I did a lot of 54 Below concerts. I did a web series um, with Taylor Lauterman, and, like was a backup dancer for her and did a bunch of random commercial things um, and then got a choreography gig and it was my first professional choreography gig and it was an off-Broadway show and it was terrifying. <laughs> the story goes that at Penn State I met Susan Schulman who was the um, Broadway director for Little Women, um, Sweeney Todd, Secret Garden, she did a ton of Broadway shows and she was a teacher at Penn State and my senior year she asked me to choreograph a concert of On the Town that she was directing and it was I truly was like gonna like throw up I was so nervous when I said yes and did it and I had no idea if I was successful or not I had no idea what she thought of me afterwards except for when I was interviewing for this choreographer position for this off-Broadway show the director of the show who happens to be Rob Schneider who did very good Eddie here um, knew, knew Susan and called Susan and said you know, there's this girl, Caitlin, she's interviewing for this position, it's down to her and this other choreographer, like, Susan, do you reckon, like, what would you say, yes or no to Caitlin, she's really young to be taking on this role, and Susan, I found out then, gave her blessing, um, so I found out that a year and a half later, she liked what I did on, on the town, um, and that is how I got this gig, um, doing choreographing, my first, the first time I was ever paid to choreograph was an off-Broadway show, which was really overwhelming. And Rob called me that night, it was the day Disney Plus came out, because I was watching Frozen on Disney Plus, and Elsa was singing, let it go, and Rob was like, do you want to choreograph a show? And I was just like <laughs> sobbing while Elsa was playing. Oh my gosh, it was the most like magical moment. And then from there, I did that show, and 18 days later, it closed and the pandemic hit. And then, and here I am um, now. So I also met Beth um, Furrier at Penn State. She was one of my teachers. 
And so Beth, Rob, and Ali Maroney, who is the director for Gentleman's Guide, we, I had connections to all of them, and they had all said, Caitlin, you should apply for this choreographer position at Clog. And so that is sort of how that story happened that I came to be here um, at Clog. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So Broadway credit and off-Broadway credit. And you, you're still in school? I am. I am. I'm randomly getting my master's in nonprofit leadership, um, <laughs> which in, in arts administration. My mom is a CEO of the Boys and Girls Club in Oklahoma, and I've always had a heart and a love for nonprofits. And most theaters run as a nonprofit, um, so <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so I thought, well. I'm starting, to, I'm still performing, but I also am starting to do things that are on the other side of the table, and I, it would probably be really beneficial for me to learn how those things work on the other side. So I've done everything from, I was in a, over COVID, I uh, was a staff accountant for a year, <laughs> um, after all my accounting classes I did, and tests that I took, so that I sort of have had that journey, uh, but I'm in my second year of getting my master's in nonprofit leadership. That's incredible. And what age did you start to dance? What was the age? Three. Three? Now, three. Do, you, do you find that people who start at that age, is there a, like a cutoff point where? Yeah, I think a lot of people go like three to 10, and then you either really get into it or you want to do something else. Um, and most, pe most kids at that age are like doing soccer or do and dance, you know? It's like you haven't quite committed to one thing yet. And I know for me, I was doing soccer and dance. And when I was 10 or 11, I decided, because it was at the time, I either went competitive soccer or competitive dance, and I chose dance. Um, and I think a lot of people I know sort of stop around age 10, and then if they discover in high school that they really want to do theater, they start taking classes again. But there's usually a, a fairly big gap of at least four to five years that if you decide to stop taking dance and then realize it is what you want to do, that you start up back in high school. Interesting. Um, and so you also did competitive dancing, yes. correct? Yes. Ma mainly or more theatrical dancing? It was mainly competitive. Mainly competitive. Yeah. I, what style? Um, so I competed all styles, but my main thing was tap. <laughs> my tap shoes. <laughs> um, yeah, tap is just, oh my gosh, I fell in love with tap, I think, because it's so musical. And all dance is musical. Um, but you get to be an additional instrument and you get to play either what the band is playing or whatever, you know, CD is playing at the time. Like, you can play and those exact rhythms or you can complement them with something alternating and then you can play treble and bass with your tap shoes. Mm -hmm. And I just, I started to fall in love with it and I started competing um, sort of across the country and then I uh, had a couple tap teachers. When I did, um, when I was a kid and I was, doing shows on Broadway, I had a tap teacher who really took me under his wing and he had studied with some of the greats. So I just spent months and months and months studying with him. And then I had, and that was very theatrical, like very, you know, Fred Astaire, that kind of world, that older uh, tap world. And then in the competition world, I was very like rhythm, heavy rhythm tapper. So it was like really into the ground. It was completely opposite of what I had been studying for a couple years in New York. And that teacher had asked me to kind of assist him um, touring cities and teaching. So I got to assist him like in Michigan and in Jersey, New Jersey and different places teaching with him um, at different conventions. And so I learned basically two really different contrasting styles of tap and then just started combining them. And that's sort of where I found my love and niche in tap is how can you take something that feels old school but sort of add, I don't want to say newer rhythms, but rhythms that maybe what your ear wouldn't hear initially. Um, and I think that that's somehow, you talk about how do you bring golden age musicals into like this century sometimes. And I think in tap especially, you keep the upper body the same but change up some of the rhythms or you know make it a little different and contemporize it, if you will. Um, so that's sort of how I found my love for tap, um, and that maybe. Would you like to show? I would do a little ditty for you all. <laughs> so my, I when I competed, I would usually have something choreographed, but I'd always put a section in there that was all improv. 
because improv is just like my favorite. I think it's so fun to do. And um, so I thought I'd give you one of my favorite jazz standards and improv for you guys for a second. Show you what it means. <laughs> Whereas something that's just blank, 
you can do whatever the heck you want with it. So I have my two notebooks, one that's lined for my heart that I write all the notes in for the director, <laughs> and one that's just sketch paper that I start to form everything. And I'll, every choreographer has their own way of doing things. I have to see, well, I've talked to Miles about this because I probably sound crazy, but I have to see the number before I can add any steps in. So I have to know, okay, I have to see how it starts, which usually there's a scene leading up to a number. So, you know, how does the director finish that scene and hand it off to me? What props am I using? What set pieces are there? I love to make people stand on things so you get different heights on stage. What's that big picture? And it's the story that, then talking about the story, okay, did they start together? Did they start spread out and come together? What are the formation changes? And how do those transition? Because I think a lot of what makes a really good number is actually not the steps and the formations, but your transitions into them, because they can be really choppy if you don't have those solid transitions. So figuring out those moments so that I can kind of see the outline of it, and then I go back and listen to the music on repeat, just over and over and over and over again, try to memorize. I have a score in front of me, trying to look for accents, counting how many eight counts do I have in this section, and then at the very, the last thing I do is add in the steps. So, which feels very counterintuitive when you think choreography, you know, come up with the steps, but that's the last thing I do, and usually if I do that process, coming up with the steps goes a lot faster. There's a lot of me just sitting and writing and listening, and trying to visualize. And there's actually a number that we were doing that I said, it just looks blurry, I can't figure it out. And I kept hot C miles to replay and replay and replay certain sections of a number. Because I just, I kept saying, it just looks blurry, I can't see it, I can't see it. And finally, with the help of Miles, we kind of did a music analysis of that piece, and which is really helpful to have someone as brilliant as Miles to talk through that with. Um, we figured out it was no longer blurry. <laughs> I could finally choreograph. Um, but also talking about the students, I didn't know any of their abilities coming into this. So as soon as the cast list was given, I of course went to all their websites and their Instagram pages and was like, did anybody post anything about dance? And um, some of them had, and some of them I could tell came from strictly like a vocal performance background and probably hadn't had much of any dance. So I told them all on the first day, I'm really patient, I will always work with you, but I'm not gonna be easy on you. And they were like, okay, they totally took that and ran with it, and they have been like the best group of people to work with. They just say yes and, and never say I can't do that. They'll say we'll figure it out, which has been so helpful. Um, and I think a lot of what working with all these different abilities, you really have to think, um, about weight changes, because that's what usually trips people up in dances and, you know, where's my weight and how do I transfer onto another foot? So you have to think, okay, if someone hasn't been consistently taking dance classes, they don't know that. So it changes how I teach it. Instead of saying right, left, ball, change, step, I'll say shift your weight, shift your weight, rock back, forward. You know, that's how I have to verbalize it instead of teaching it maybe how I would if I was working with the Rockettes or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. That's how you would have to teach me. <laughs> That's amazing. So how long would you say it takes, um, so the Jitterbug mm -hmm. is a, a tap song in the show tonight. How long would it take you from beginning research to end to come up with choreography? How long does that take? That's a good question. Um, well, for Jitterbug, I knew I wanted to research what the actual Jitterbug looks like and um, what swing steps of the time looks like and how partner dancing was looking because if you when you hear the song it feels very much okay this is like I, part lends itself to partner dance but I knew I didn't want the jitterbugs to partner dance because the dance is not about partnering it was about Dorothy and the gang and we couldn't partner dance until we've sort of captured them if you will the jitterbugs are, are evil um, and so I thought how can I take the swing dance and tap have very, very similar weight shifts. And so I thought, how can I research that and incorporate tap and put it in the same number? So that's sort of where I started, by watching just a bunch of, there's actually so much on YouTube of just people improv like partner dancing, just, and it's all improv, and you just sort of watch them, and I pick out pictures that I think look cool, or a step that I think we could be able to do here, and that kind of thing. Um, and then combine it with my love for tap and kind of 
figure out how that goes together. So I do a lot of research first, and then I listen to the music over and over and over again and start to map it out. I map it out is when I start to draw out on my paper that's not lined, um, all the formations. Um, and all, I mean, that can take, research can take as long as an hour, because I'm like, oh, I get it, this is something I'm familiar with, or that can just be like days and days of research, kind of depending um, on how familiar I am with a certain style or time period or whatever it is. Um, for Jitterbug, I had done a little bit of swing dance before, so it, it came a little more quickly to me. Um, so I'd say I spent a couple hours on that. Then it does, the longest part is figuring out the mapping it out, if you will. That usually takes me a couple hours. And then, depending on how strong of a map I have, the steps don't take too long. If it wasn't a tap number, it probably would have taken me an hour and a half. And although I feel that my strongest style is tap, it's the one that takes me the longest because you're another instrument. So every sound you make has like is a choice versus if I'm just doing a jazz, you know, chasse, step, leap, or a batmar, or a turn, that doesn't make noise, it makes an accent somehow, or it's musical, but everything I'm doing with my feet is a choice, and it has to either complement or contrast what Miles is doing, so I have to choose, you know, if you're playing trouble, if you're playing something really light, it's really heavy, and if I'm wanting, the, if there's a section and I don't want it to end, I think that tap step should end somehow up so that you know there's more to say. But if I'm thinking, hey, we're transitioning to a new section, I'm probably gonna end something down, bass, or something that basically has a period at the end of the statement so that I know it, to the audience might not catch that that's what's happening, but to your ear, you'll hear, oh, end of a phrase, start of a new section. So it sort of, it takes a while to figure that part out, I'm gonna stand up again. And if, um, if I'm doing something like da 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 da, I can end that. Or like there's so many versions of that rhythm. I might hear a rhythm, but I have to think where is the up and where is the down of every sound I'm making, so that it either goes with what Miles is playing or adds a fun little. I like to call it chasing the music. If he has an accent, then I have an accent. Like how you can chase the music. Um, so that, that actually tap takes me the longest because I think there's so much more to hear and figure out with it. So I would say, oh, I don't know, overall 12 hours? <laughs> That's incredible. And she has to do that outside of rehearsals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> at, at the night, I, I walked in on her and Lucas Hall just sitting at the desk like with, with props as she's choreographing all of the numbers well into midnight and yes, past. Yes. Um, Oh, that's wonderful. So, it, for those, oh, we had a question. Can you remember it? Oh, but you have to write it down. That's that's a great question. I do a combination of if I have, if I'm just working on one show and not trying to like think about three shows at once, like I am here. <laughs> um, what I do is I mark. I get those little circle dots at the you know stickers at the store, and I write A in wherever on my unlined paper and I write A, section A, and then I find it in the score and I put that same color dot and write A there so I know when I'm looking at my score and I'm looking at the map of what I'm doing, where the sections line up and then I usually write key notes in my mapped out paper of like, these are the big bullet points of what we're hitting so I kind of know where we're going but in the score I will write out every single step. Now here, that's very time consuming and I don't, you know, time is very precious here. So I usually record. I'll just set up my camera and flip it around and press record. And they're usually very, or Maria has walked in so many times and recorded for me because she's an angel. Um, but I'll usually just talk through the number. I won't do it with music. I'll just like slowly talk through it. So when I do it, when I teach it the next day, I'll remember what, what I was thinking at 1 a.m. Because <laughs> sometimes it's not very clear. <laughs> yeah. Is there a difference between having the musicians behind you and the whole orchestra in front of you? Yes. I think, well, for the dancers, especially for tap, I think it's way easier for them to rush their tap steps because they don't see Miles going, here's the downbeat. Yeah. Um, and it's, you're kind of at the mercy a little bit of the tap dancers. When, if they start to rush, 
they're, you're behind them. So unless that Nick, our drummer, unless he just really pouts out that beat and doesn't let them rush, you sort of are at the mercy of the people with the tap shoes on. Um, I have yelled at them many times to not rush, but sometimes your adrenaline goes and you just, I can't help it. Um, I think, you know, I'm not on stage doing it, so I don't know what if they hear anything different. Um, I mean, I personally, like you saw when I did improv, you kept looking at Miles, because it's like, I want to like, I love that connection of like, when people, when the orchestra is in front of you, having that connection of with that instrument, because when you're an instrument on your feet and you can't connect with anyone else who's making noise, it feels a little strange to me. I don't know if the actors are experiencing that at all, but I prefer for to be able to see them. Yes. I do too. Yeah. Uh, uh, now that you're conducting backstage as opposed to being in front, yeah. that's their issue. What, what do you find the difference? Oh, well, it's immense. Um, the, the hardest thing, so the way that it works, um, I actually have my headphones over there and I need to remember to get them. So everyone help me remember, <laughs> otherwise I'll forget. And I won't be able to hear the things. But the, um, the biggest difference is actually hearing their breath so that we can line up together. Now this show, I will say, I, I also music directed Gentleman's Guide. This show is much simpler in that the way that the show is structured, it's cue line song, and then that ends and we're in a new place. But Gentleman's Guide was basically played through, and it was a lot of stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. And in order for us to land, if I'm in front of them, I can see them breathe and I can lift us in together. But because of that, I find that we are behind more often, um, as in like they'll start singing and then we come in, just because of that lack of sight. And there's no video monitoring system either. Um, yeah, that, that I would think is the biggest uh, difference. Also, the energy, we, like Caitlin said, we feed off of each mm -hmm. other. Um, it's also uh, much scarier if, because if something goes wrong, there's no way for you to communicate. You're just at the mercy of whatever happens. And we've had that happen a couple of times. It's live theater. Um, and it, it always gets back on track. But it's much scarier because all I have is the aural, like, are they singing or are they not? Or is it the right words? Did they jump a section and that kind of thing? Um, but it's gone very smoothly, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, any other questions? Yes. I think in the, in the first play, wasn't the, the, the musical accompaniment in the pit? And then for the next one? They've always been behind the stage. The only show that you've been able to see the pit for is Trouble in Tahiti. Yeah. And then next week, for Little Women, mm -hmm. there will you will also be able to see the pit, but they will still be behind the stage. And that actually does help. Even seeing someone breathe from behind helps you. Um, but with this, it's called sight, is D-Y-C. Um, you can't see through it, so um, yeah. Any other questions? Choreography question? Was it an option to have the three musicians in the pit rather than behind? I believe that it was, I mean, not initially. And what ended up happening with the COVID restriction, it was done completely for COVID. Mm. Um, and it lifted too late and we, the band lifted too late and we, built a platform already, and we moved a piano already onto an acoustic piano, and it, it's very time-consuming, expensive, and also people can potentially get hurt to move the piano. So we've decided to keep it back there for the season. But we will be returning to our normal amount of musicians next year. Was it a fear of spreading germs that you're in the back? Um, there was, at some point, we just wanted to keep as much distance uh -huh. from each other as possible. Yeah. Um, so that, that was the decision there. Um, and we chose bass, drums, piano because that orchestration can be filled out nicely. Now, is it as full as a full orchestra? No, it never will be. Especially for something like Wizard of Oz, which is MGM-tastic, with you know, 50 musicians <laughs> playing that soundtrack. 
Um, but we, we, we do our best. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes? Um, I know what a ballet warm-up looks like for stretching at the bar. What do you do to warm up before you dance? Yeah, I definitely, I like to do cardio first. It kind of depends. If I have a long time, I will definitely just do a full, more of a jazz warm up that incorporates a little bit of ballet, but doing a lot of up and down and like down and almost even a little bit of yoga and then going into a little bit of ballet. Um, and that can, I can, if I have 45 minutes, I will do a full 45 minute warm up that includes like abs and push ups and you know, all of that. If I only have a few minutes, I will hold a plank and do push-ups because that like really gets your blood flowing and the most important thing when you dance is that you're warm. So if you just stretch, it does nothing if you haven't done cardio first. So the most important thing is to get your heart rate up. And so if I have to go on in a split second, I'm doing push-ups and holding a plank because that way I know my core is engaged and I know I'm at least sweating a little bit before I go on so I don't hurt anything. If it's a big tap show, I'll also do a bit of a tap warm up, which basically is making sure your shoes are just broken in, making sure your ankles are, you know, there's a lot of footwork, but you have to have really loose ankles to be able to do it, because if you're holding tension, you can't make any sounds. Um, and <laughs> making sure, this is how I teach my kids, um, you have to make sure your tap shoes smile, so you have to make sure the crease is really broken into your tap shoes, so you're really pressing into that. And there's something called the sweet spot in your tap shoes, so on mine is, you, well, if you look closely, it's all worn in at the, at the bottom of this first tap. And that's where you can't ever have your heels down on the floor when you're tapping, or else it just sounds like this, unless you're specifically dropping your heels. So it's, you have to warm up your sweet spot and tap so that when you land anything, you land with your heels slightly off the ground and you have to practice that balance. If I'm going like this, I'm not dropping my heels and falling back. So if it's a big top show, I'll make sure to warm up my ankles and the sweet spot in my top shoes so that I know my balance is good for the show and I don't drop my heels and make extra sounds I'm not supposed to. I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yes? How old were you when you played the understudy for the line? I was in the first grade when I did that. And that was, yeah, I, I can't believe, like now looking back, that people ever trust kids on stage because they're so unpredictable. <laughs> and they're sometimes the best actors out there because they just do what they're told. But um, yeah, I was in the first grade and I can't, I don't remember being scared. And I like look back now and it's like, that was a huge theater with like incredible New York artists. And I was just oblivious. I was like, oh, I get to go on and like, sing and dance. And it was, it was very joyful. Um, yeah, first grade and then it sort of just went from there. Um, so, Caitlin, what are like three things that the audience can look for in the show tonight, choreographically? Yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, just overall, the jitterbug number is really fun. We've talked to um, we've talked about it a lot. You can look for um, the traditional Wizard of Oz stuff that's in the movie. Now, I have to say, this Wizard of Oz is not the movie. But the thing that we did steal from the movie is the traditional, we're all supposed to be the wizard, yeah. Okay, we don't do it the whole time, but you can look out for that step. Um, if anybody knows the show Alita, there's a very um, famous pose from it, and that goes like this, and you're, it's in the opening number of it. It happens a lot. And so I was like, how can we differentiate the munchkins, which are just a joy to watch. They are so funny. Um, how do we differentiate munchkins from the people in Emerald City who are very different? So I was like, what's the difference from like doing this to like being someone who's regal? And I kept coming back to this. So instead of making it look exactly like Evita, I had them take a step out and make it look like this. So you'll see that pose a lot that I got the inspiration from the original choreography of Evita. Um, you can also look out for Lullaby League and for the Lollipop Guild. They are doing original movie choreography. Yeah, okay, that's wonderful. And for those of you, um, the Jitterbug was a song that was oh, cut yes. from the movie. And I very much recommend you watch it because it is so much fun. And to yes. hear Judy Garland sing oh. it is fabulous and great yeah. The gang. Yes. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yes. I, I understand that there was a had to be a last minute directorial change. Yes. To the show. 
And I bet Caitlin had a lot to do with making this show come off as well as it did. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, it was a whole team of us. Uh, Beth was amazing and yeah. stepped in and did so much. But we sort of just said, okay, last minute, let's just do it. You know, it was it was almost a little freeing because we said, you know what, we're just gonna go for it and see what happens. And the students were just so on board, and it ended up being like the most fun rehearsal process ever because everyone was just like, let's go, let's do a show, no matter what happens. Absolutely. I think that you'll be able to, there's a palpable sense of their joy, especially this story, as iconic as it is. I, I think that mm -hmm. it's a really beautiful show. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy it. It's going to be wonderful. Thank you. Any last questions? Well, thank you so much for having us, and thank you for all of your support. Please know that this, my career personally, has is I have clock to thank for everything, and so thank you for giving and supporting this institution because it is so important. Session, grab your tickets and head on in. <laughs> <laughs>